Open your Bibles to the fifth chapter of Paul's letter there to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. Our text is verses 6 through 14. We began last week. We'll continue on in that same section this week. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. But as we begin here, let's take a moment to pray and ask the Spirit of God to make his word effectual in our hearts and minds as we hear. Our Father, we thank you for what has already preceded this time here in the public gathering of the church. We've had opportunity to sing your praise, to encourage and exhort one another to trust Christ in all of the circumstances of life through song. We've heard from the word read and been reminded of the amazing gospel of Jesus Christ, that in union with him, the power of sin and death has been shattered in our lives, and that we are no longer slaves of sin, in bondage and unable to resist. And Father, we also have been blessed with baptisms to see those make public their testimony, and we have seen parents come forward and commit themselves to a life of faith in the raising of their children. So much has happened and our hearts are already filled. And, and now we come here to, to hear through the word of God a unique opportunity, our Father, that presents itself to us week in and week out as the word of God is opened and, and the scriptures are preached. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your spirit would be active even now among us. Father, there are all kinds of distractions that seek to draw our attention away. Cares and concerns of the weak, struggles with our own shortcomings and failures, relational difficulties, problems at work, many things, the list goes on. But Father, we know that we need to be effectual hearers of the word that our ears need to be unstopped and our eyes opened and our hearts filled with faith. And we know that it is a divine work of grace. And so please, in the moments we have here now, may you do a mighty work among us and transform us as your people, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We are returning again here to the fifth chapter and, and continuing on with that section which addresses the, the rather distasteful topic of sexual immorality and impurity among the people of God. This is definitely not something that any of us likes to talk about. Perhaps more than any other sinful behaviors, sexual sin strikes deep at the core of our being. It it um, brings heartache and hardship into the lives of many, many people. It causes disruption among the people of God. It is a serious, serious matter. And last week as we began the section here, I had a very lengthy introduction for you. Some of you were, were betting secretly whether I would even get beyond the introduction. And it was long, and I know it was long, and it was intentionally long in order to raise the level of awareness and seriousness of the topic that we have before us. Uh, we live in a sin-saturated culture. It's used to sell everything. And we, uh, like the proverbial frog in the kettle, can lose track of the reality that the water is growing increasingly hot and that we are threatened by this world in which we live, threatened in the sense of adopting its sexual ethic and living as if we do not know Christ. And so the topic is big, it's important. We looked and took the time to survey quickly what the scriptures say about this and how the fact that it's repeatedly spoken of in both Old and New Testament, and we saw the damage that it brought to the nation of Israel by their continual uh, dabbling in these things which are really expressions of paganism. We also looked at quickly 2,000 years of church history, and boy, was that fast. 
Um, but we did so in order to recognize that it wasn't just a New Testament problem, it just wasn't an Old Testament problem, but remained a problem in the church and remains a problem today. And in the process, we also spoke about monasticism and that movement by earnest people attempting to try to deal with these things wrongly in, in their approach, but still the earnestness of their hearts to attempt to deal with um, the worldliness that is in the church. And uh, that led us into the recovery of a more biblical, balanced biblical ethic with regard to the Puritans, and we introduced the concept of the, what's known as the Puritan dilemma. The Puritan dilemma. How to be in the world and not be of the world. This is what the Puritans wrestled with in all really aspects and fronts of life. And so we find our spiritual roots firmly established there with the Puritans. We understand their struggles. We can identify with their struggles. Worldliness is a threat. It's always been a threat. It remains a threat today. And so we introduced this worldliness, this topic of worldliness, and, and asked and answered it in, in terms of a, of a short um, definition that I want to just go back to again to get our thinking uh, revved up and going here again. So we asked the question, what is worldliness? And we answered it, and this comes from a book of that title, Worldliness, we answered it this way, it is a love for this fallen world. It's loving the values and pursuits of the world that stand opposed to God. More specifically, it is to gratify and exalt oneself to the exclusion of God. It rejects God's rule and replaces it with our own. It exalts our opinions above God's truth. It elevates our sinful desires for the things of this fallen world above God's commands and promises. Worldliness, and it attacks in many, many ways, but sticking with the book of Ephesians and the topic that has been brought before our eyes by virtue of the pen of the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit of God here in chapter 5, we have to talk about worldliness in terms of our sexuality. A whole sermon series could be done on worldliness to be sure, but we're going to stay primarily focused in the matter before us, which is sexuality. A worldly sexual ethic that is a constant threat to the people of God, that, it, that it's an encroachment into the church of Jesus Christ. And we said here for verses 6 through 14, which is the section that is before us, that we uh, can derive from it three guiding principles. And that's the broad outline of the text. Three guiding principles that we must keep in mind as we navigate our, own, our way through our own Puritan dilemma. Here we are in the year 2018, and we are faced with the Puritan dilemma, particularly here for us with regard to sexualities. And so we need to navigate our way through it. Paul gives us some very, very important instruction here, these, these principles, and there were three of them. I'll review them again quickly with you. They will form the macro outline for the whole section, and here they are. In verses 6 through 10, we need to grow up theologically. 6 through 10, we need to grow up theologically. Second, in verses 11 to 13, we need to speak up Truthfully, grow up theologically, speak up truthfully so that, verse 14, people might wake up spiritually. So grow up theologically, speak up truthfully so that people might wake up spiritually. Last week we began, and today again we will make progress. Last week I went really long, and I apologize um, primarily to those that are in the nursery. The rest of you I'm not so worried about, but... <laughs> because uh, you'll just get up and leave if you've had enough. But those in the nursery, they're stuck. And so, uh, nursery workers, um, I apologize to you. I'll try to be better today. Okay? But anyway, we introduced the Grow Up Theologically, the, the first guiding principle. And we'll make some progress today. Paul says here in verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things... The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
Therefore, do not be partakers with them. If we're going to grow up theologically, then we need to develop a robust and a mature Christian sexual ethic. How we understand our sexuality and how we express that needs to be informed by the Word of God. It's not just something that can just sit out there and without attention. It requires serious attention. It requires serious thought, and it requires a, a submission to the Spirit of God through the Word of God, and that's what it means to grow up, to mature. And we need to be unflinching in this. And it's easy to say, okay, well, I'll listen to you for this area and this area and this area, but there is this secret closet in my life, the door is closed, and I'm the only one with the key, and you're not coming in there. And I pray that the Spirit of God would burst that door open in my heart and yours, wherever we are walling things off from God, that this morning that we would refrain, we would throw open that door, we would allow the Spirit of God to come in and shine the light of the truth of the Word of God into every region and crevice and crack of our lives so that we might grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, growing up theologically, we said, is, is broken down here into really three foundational truths, and that's our sub-outline. Three foundational truths, the first of which is here in verses 6 through 7, that sexual sin is serious. Sexual sin is serious. Again, Paul says, let no one deceive you. There are a lot of deceivers out there, both in the church and outside the church. Let no one deceive you with empty words. That is words void of meaning. For because of these things, what things? Because of the things that have just been spoken of in verses 3, 4, and 5. Impurity, immorality, um, filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting impurity, all of these things, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And it is coming upon, notice what he says, the sons of disobedience there in verse 6. The sons of disobedience, that same terminology, the sons of disobedience is used over in chapter 2 and verse 2 to speak about who we once were before Christ saved us before the, the grace of God flooded our hearts, before the Spirit of God uh, vibed us, enlivened us, caused us to be born again and united us with Jesus Christ, we too were those sons of disobedience. In other words, the lost, those whose lives are so characterized by disobedience to the Word of God that they become identified with it, they become sons of that very disobedience. And Paul says here in verses six, uh, 6 and 7 that this is a very, very serious matter with regard to our sexuality and the perversions of it. And, the, and, and it's because of this that, that wrath is coming. Now, it's important to say here, I think, that <clears throat> Paul is not threatening the Christian with wrath. Okay? We might read this and find here something that, that perhaps is a little incongruous to us. The, the, the idea that, that um, wow, uh, the wrath of God will come upon me as a Christian? And the answer is no. Okay, if you, are a, if you are a child of God this morning, if you have closed with Christ by faith, if you are united with him, you are a born-again child of God this morning, then the wrath of God for you has been satisfied in the cross of Jesus Christ. The entirety of the wrath of God for the entirety of your sin, past, present, and future, has all been poured on Christ. And he has drunk the, wrath, the cup of the wrath of God to, to the very last drop for you. So you do not need fear the wrath of God. That is not Paul's point here. Paul's point in raising the topic of the wrath of God here in verses 6 and 7 is to use it as an object lesson for the believer. It is an object lesson. And the object lesson is, is this is, God is serious about this matter, and he is so serious that his wrath will be poured forth. It, it draws out the wrath of God. So it is a very, very serious matter, Christian. So do not fear his wrath in that sense, but do not miss the object lesson either, that we have no business messing in the things that belong to those who are characterized as the sons of disobedience. Okay, This is an object lesson to us that it might steer us away 
from sin, this form of sin, and steer us back to Christ. All right, so sexual sin is serious. That's the first foundational truth. Secondly, the second foundational truth under growing up theologically is that conversion is radically transformational. Okay, conversion is radically transformational. Verse 8, I'll pick it up in 7. Therefore do not part be partakers with them, the sons of disobedience. Why? Verse 8, 4. There's your reason. For you were formerly darkness. For you were formerly darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Paul introduces here a dominant New Testament theme. In fact, it's more than the New Testament. It's, it can be found in the Old Testament as well. And it's the, the theme of light and darkness. Light and darkness. And and, the, and the, the stark contrast that exists between light and darkness. You can't be, uh, you know, a little bit dark or a little bit light. It's, it's sort of like saying you're a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't, okay? And so you are either darkness or you are light. You don't have a foot in both worlds. You can't have a foot in both worlds. There is something radical that has happened. If you are a child of God this morning, and, and Paul speaks of it here in verse 8, and it is an amazing a radical transformation with profound implications for all of the Christian life, but in particular in context here for us as believers putting off the world's sexuality or sexual ethic. So Paul is speaking here about the incompatibility, really, of the people of God and the people of this world. And you can see that, that is a is a biblical theme. I mean, it goes way back into Genesis. There you, you can find the line of Seth and the line of Cain, right? Those who are of the line of God and those who are of the, of the sons of men, as it were, and, and they are not to be mixed because they are radically different. And, and we see the same kind of thing here. There are those of, that are light and there are those that are darkness. And you cannot be part of, of both. You are one or you are the other. Now, the, the, the theme of darkness is, is illustrative. It, it, the writers use this because darkness is emblematic. And it is emblematic of a number of things, not the least of which is ignorance, right? And you can, uh, you can see that back in uh, chapter 4 and verse 18, right? Uh, where Paul says there, uh, he's talking about who we, uh, how we should not walk like the Gentiles who are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. So, so darkness is emblematic of an ignorance, a spiritual ignorance, a, a, a depravity. In other words, a, a, a quest and thirst and pursuit of that which is contrary to God. And... and um, and it's that which once characterized the person before their conversion, darkness. It is the realm of, of sin and, and the power of sin. This is the, the realm of darkness. And we speak about that, the kingdom of darkness. We talk about the, the prince of darkness. And so we understand here that it is a metaphor. He is speaking in an illustrative way here to talk about this dramatic contrast. There is darkness and there is light. Now what I want you to see here, taking a look at verse 8 again and looking at it more closely, where Paul says, you were formerly darkness. Notice he doesn't say here, you were in darkness. He doesn't say formerly you lived in darkness. What he says is that formerly you were darkness. In other words, you are the embodiment. Before Christ, we were the embodiment of darkness, that which is ignorant, that which is in opposition to God, that which is uh, driven towards sin and under the power of sin. So you were darkness. And again, in context here, sexual sin is a natural outworking of that darkness, you see it in chapter 4, verse 19, right? Having become callous, they have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice 
of every kind of impurity with greediness. Sexual sin is the natural outworking of a life that is darkness, that is darkness. And Paul is saying, again, look at verse 8, you formerly were darkness, but now, but now, the contrast here could not be more shocking, more clear, more radical. But now you are light in the Lord. You see it? You were formerly darkness, but now something has changed. And the but now brings about that you are light in the Lord. There has been a transformation that has been brought about. You have been transformed and uh, that transformation is not just a change of your surroundings. It's not just that you, you know, you were living in a world of darkness. Now you're living in a world of light, although that is true. But it's deeper than that. It's more profound than that. It's more radical than that. What has transformed here is you. Your very existence has been transformed. You have been, you have been moved, you have been born again, you have been regenerated, you have been removed from the realm of Adam, and you have been placed into the realm of Christ, into the union with Christ. You are light. And notice how he says, you're not light in and of yourself, you're light in the Lord. In other words, that your light is a reflection of his light. You don't become individual lights it is the light of God. It's like the moon and the sun. The moon has no light of its own. It reflects the light of the sun. And so that's what Paul is saying here, is that you are light in the Lord. You have become a child of God. God himself is represented in the Scriptures by light. Right? The Scriptures speak of God, that he dwells in unapproachable light. And it, and it speaks of his purity and his holiness and his separation from from all that is, is sinful and defiling. And so we have been born again. We have been changed. We have been transformed. And the implications of the transformation, as they say, are profound. They are profound. We have become, to use different language, a new creation, right? The old is dead. Behold, all things have become new. We have passed from death to life. And it is this transformation that Paul speaks of here in verse 8 that provides the power and the motivation for us to live out our family likeness, right? The end of verse 8, walk as children of light. You have been changed. Something has happened. It is radical. You were darkness. You are now light in the Lord. Live out the family likeness. Walk as children of light. This is what we would call classic Pauline theology. This is how Paul writes his letters. This is how Paul uh, teaches us to live the Christian life. And it is this, the indicative precedes the imperative. In other words, the statement of reality expressed in indicative verbs precedes the imperative verbs, the commands to do something or not do something. So Paul doesn't say, clean yourself up, take a bath, shine a light on your head, you know, change your clothes. He doesn't say any of those things because none of those things are helpful to us. You cannot self-reform. But the power and, 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 and that self-reformation, pardon me, self-reformation has no strength or power to overcome the temptation of sin. What? enables us to, to battle sin and to live for God is to recognize what has happened, the indicative. You once were light or darkness, you are now light. You were once dead, you're now alive. You were once united to Adam, you are now united to Christ. Recognize that reality, believe the truth of that reality, and then in light of that, here's how you act. Now comes the commands. The book itself is structured that way. We have noted that more than once, right? Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are the indicative chapters. They speak about who we are in Christ, what Jesus has done for us. And chapters 4, 5, and 6 speak about in light of that, here are the imperatives, here are the commands, here's how you're supposed to live. And we're right in the middle of the here's how you're supposed to live portion, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why it's not wise to jump, to sort of parachute into the middle of a New Testament epistle, particularly a Pauline epistle, and just start preaching the last few chapters. Because what can come across is, boy, I better work harder. 
I need to pull myself up by my bootstraps. There's a lot of stuff I got to do. I got to do this and I, and I can't do that. And, and if you leave out the beginning, the theology of it all, the indicatives, then you are in a process of self-reformation and you will be sure to fail. You will be sure to fail. So, as believers, our ethical behavior is rooted in the reality of us becoming new creations in Christ. It's rooted here in chapter 5 and his expression here in the reality that we are now children of light in the Lord. Now, just reviewing here. The coming of the wrath of God, verse 6, should be a compelling enough reason. It should be compelling enough reason for the children of God to not live out the sexual ethics of the fallen world around them. That ought to be enough. In other words, knowing what displeases our loving Father ought to be enough to motivate us not to engage in those things. But it's not powerful enough to enable us not to engage in these things. The only reality that is powerful enough to, for the believer to overcome the pull of the, of the darkness is the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the indicative, is the, the recognition of what has really happened. If you're a Christian this morning, to you, you are not the same person. You are not the same person. And so the primary reason and the powerful uh, motivating force that enables you and I as a child of God this morning to battle successfully against the, the, the wicked sexual morals and ethics of the fallen world that Paul outlines there in very quick form in verses 3, 4, and 5 is the reality of our conversion. Moral darkness is inconsistent with our new nature in Christ. It is inconsistent. This is what the Word of God says. Now the question becomes is, do we believe it? Do we believe it? Because it is only as we believe it that we access the power of the gospel. We are saved by grace through Faith alone. As we believe the gospel presented to us in the pages of Scripture, the Spirit of God uh, transforms us through that gospel into the child of God. And there is a one-way turnstile in which we move from darkness to light. But as we continue to live for Christ, we continue to live by that same gospel. And we are called upon to believe that same gospel. And that Belief in that same gospel, skillfully applied to our lives, day in, day out, moment by moment as needed, enables us to walk as children of light. And then it's not self-reformation. Then it's not pull myself up by my bootstraps. Then it's not, here's a list of things I do, and here's a list of things I don't do, and that's how I'm battling the flesh. You know, I do this, pardon me, and I don't do that. Serious, serious reflection is needed on this exact point. This is, by the way, the whole message, really, of um, Paul's letter to the Galatians. He says, oh, foolish Galatians, you began the race by faith. Are you now going to finish the, way, the race through works in your own strength? What are, what are you trying to do here? And, and, and that temptation of the Galatians remains a temptation for the people of God. It remains a temptation for me and for you this morning here. The power here is in the gospel. It is the radical transformation that has happened in your conversion. And to think upon that, there is the power to overcome sin. And as we meditate on this reality, as we think upon this reality, then the Spirit of God activates the power of this gospel within us and it transforms us. It changes us. It, it gives us the strength to say no, to change the channel to avert our eyes, to, 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 to uh, reel in the, the passions of our own hearts and to walk in a way that is pleasing and holy before the Lord.
thinking about all of this. So you, you think about the temptation of sexual sin. And recognize that it's a temptation that all of us face. Okay? You're not alone. You're a child of God this morning. You're not alone in this. There is these, these, these temptations that come upon each and every one of us, to be sure. And, and the truth of the matter is, in our heart and mind, every one of us have fallen short. We have failed to access the gospel as we should. We may have attempted some sort of, of uh, fleshly uh, defense, but they're like paper walls before a, before a medieval artillery. They're, they're just going to be crumbled. And so we've fallen. All of us have fallen. And others have fallen beyond just the internal thoughts of the heart and the, and the mind. Some of you out here. I've been at this long enough. I've been an elder among God's people over 30 years. I have seen enough to know that these failures at the level of the affections of the heart for way too many become outward manifestations of a, of a, of a sexuality that God forbids to his people. And that's hard. It's, it's hard to, to acknowledge. It's, it's, it's hard to talk about. And it can be very, very discouraging. If you're, this morning, if you find yourself, you've fallen, maybe this week. Or maybe it's just been a pattern of your life. You think it's gone, and then it's back. It's gone, and it's back. That can be very, very discouraging. In fact, it can lead to despair. What's the use of trying? I, I always fall short. I always fall short. And so it, it can lead the believer, the child of God, in, into this despair where, where their continual failures just can, you know, nag at them and, and, and the accuser uses them to say, well, you're no Christian. What kind of Christian are you? For others, the... the Failures can lead to what I call delusion. Delusion. For some, it's despair. For others, it's delusion. And the delusion is, is really what Paul is speaking about here in verse 6. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by empty words. The, the delusion is, well, it's, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. Or, you know, a lot of people do this. A lot of people do this. Or it's, it's just Biology. It's just biology. That's the delusion where we seek to normalize it. And I think uh, more than once I have heard, particularly among young men, the idea that, hey, you know, I'm, we're struggling with this. And, and so they talk to their friends about it. But you know what? If everybody's, quote, struggling with it, it becomes normalized. It becomes normalized. So for some despair, for others delusion, even for some denial. What I mean by denial is, is denial of our sexuality as a good gift of God. Now, that one doesn't come as often, admittedly. But I have met some young people through the, through the years that have adopted basically a monastic approach, which is that, is that they see their sexuality and, and the, the male-female relationship within the, within the covenant bonds of marriage is something dirty, something unpleasant, something really to be avoided, and, and yet the reality of the matter is this is God's good gift to us. God's good gift to us. In all of this, the despair, the delusion, the denial, it all comes about through, through faulty thinking. Faulty thinking. I want you to look again at Paul's prescription here. Okay, look at Paul's prescription. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read. I'm going to read beginning in verse 3. We'll go back and, and just take a look at it. Paul says, But immorality 
or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with these, with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Then drop down to verses 11 and 12. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. Paul's prescription for the Christian to fight this fight and to find the victory that is ours in Christ is to begin here in verses 3 through 5 and recognize this reality that sexual immorality and mental and verbal impurity is never okay. It is never okay. Verses 6 and 7 recognize that God will judge those who reject his standard in this matter. He is very serious here. It is not okay, and it will draw out his judgment. Verse 8, the only effective defense against these temptations, beloved, is the gospel. That's the only effective defense is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then finally, verses 11 and 12, as his children, we must not equivocate on these truths. We must not. We cannot give in here. We cannot yield ground to our culture. May God apply the truth here for you and me. Strengthen us, the battle that lies before us today and in the days ahead. If something that has been said this morning has, has stirred your soul, you sense a need to, to, to have dialogue, to have questions answered. Maybe to, you've come to a place like one who testified in the, in the waters of baptism that you know all that stuff, but you are not known by Christ. If that's where you are today, then I want you to come. I'd like to talk to you. As we finish and people get up and begin to mill around, just come. Come and talk to me. Okay? Let me pray and deposit seven minutes in the bank. Okay? Father, this is an area of our lives that is uh, constantly in need of attention. There are few passions that lie within the human heart that are as powerful and can be used for good or evil. There are few passions within the human heart, in the heart of the children of God, upon which the deceitfulness of this world can so quickly latch on, and steal us away. Even in the midst of, of, of praying or, or reading the scriptures or, or ministering among God's people, I mean, it's, it's frightening how the temptations can come. And, oh, Lord, it's frightening how easy they are to give in to, how powerful is the allure. As Paul says, every other sin that a man commits, he commits outside of his body. But he who sins in this way sins against his own body. There is something about this, Lord. You have made our sexuality. We are sexual beings. 
male and female, made in the image of God, bestowed within us the the power to create life. given to us the good gift within the covenant bounds of marriage to express love and give ourselves in the most intimate of ways. Our Father, we recognize that this is so far more than biology. There is a deep spiritual reality in play here. And thus it is a tug of war. Oh, Lord, give us victory. Help us to heed your word. Help us to remember the gospel we have forgotten. Help us to have faith again in the gospel which we have doubted. Enable us as your people to be holy as you are holy. For Jesus' sake, amen.